What is up, guys? Welcome to the first episode of this podcast. We currently do not have a name, so any suggestions would be great. For the first podcast, um, I have my roommate as a guest, Mr. Andres Alcaraz. He is a former top five under 16 Mexican national rankings. He's a national champion on singles and doubles. He uh, has been a sparring partner of figures such as David Ferrer, Inigo Cervantes, Monica Puig. Um, he is currently majoring in electri- electrical engineering with a minor in computer science. He's been a member of the Dean's List and he is also a former all MIAC first team. What's up, Andres? How are you doing? Good, man. How are you? Um, thank you for having me today and, you know, I'm very excited about this. Yeah, man, I'm doing great. So, guys, this is our first podcast. Podcast, Obviously, it's my first podcast. So, you know, we're probably going to make some mistakes and just bear with us. So, let's dive, in, let's dive straight into it, man. So, how did your tennis journey start? And well, where did it start? Okay, let me go. So, it all started when I was probably a kid. Um, my father was a former pro tennis player as well. You know, it's that kind of thing that it always runs into the family. And uh, he actually started teaching me, you know, um, those holiday trips. You go to the hotel, to the beach, and then he gave me a racket, like, by the age when I was, like, four or five years, but nothing serious, just, like, a kind of holiday thing. Um, it actually started getting more serious when I was uh, about nine, ten years old uh, because we moved to a new house, and then we had a tennis court, like, right next to us. And he just said, I think, uh, he wanted to introduce me another sport, uh, that was not soccer, because in Mexico the biggest sport is soccer as well, but he wanted me to try uh, some other areas. So you were playing soccer like since the beginning? So you, you played yeah, soccer? Yeah, right? I played soccer, but but not like on a team, you know, just the regular thing you do. Maybe you play on the breaks at school. So yeah, he wanted uh, to pretty much give me a new view for another sport, and then he started teaching me tennis like in a you know regular basis, maybe three times per week, uh, five maybe. But nothing serious. All right. So when you know from there, how did you? Because um, I feel like a lot of people start tennis obviously with their parents, or you know they just take them on the court and give them a racket. But how did you? I feel like everyone remembers like when they started loving the game. You know, when they start playing matches, obviously they start winning and they start getting the sort of the high of the game. When was that? Do you remember anything like? All right, dude. When I was like eleven, I started winning these matches. Started playing tournaments. Do you remember any of that? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it was a tough journey for me. Uh, at the beginning, I, I have to be honest, I didn't really like tennis a lot. I was just more, uh, mostly going because of my dad. And, you know, the journey is, uh, it's kind of hard at the beginning. When you start going to your first tournaments, you, you, you just get beat so easily and you can get uh, disappointed very quick. Yeah. But um, I think that's one thing that I'm very grateful for, having my dad, because he was always pushing me, you know, uh, even if I was going... Uh, to, uh, to tournament and I will lose first round and and I could easily say okay I'll just give up and keep playing soccer and he was like you just have to you know work more yeah, all the time yeah more. you have to go back and work more and and he always had that mindset he always believed that um, at some point I will break through you know and start winning my first matches and in a longer term of course he had like better view of uh, tournaments and you know start having like my name uh, being called in the in the medium of tennis. Yeah. yeah. So probably that started happening when I was about 14. Um, I started having uh, much better results, and uh, yeah, you know, like national tournaments. Um, I started like uh, breaking into like that. Uh, you could say elitist circuit of the juniors. Yeah. Yeah. So. So what, what did you do, like 13, 14, you were playing national tournaments, were you playing club tournaments, where, where, were, you, where were you playing from, first of all, in Mexico, and then were you traveling around Mexico, because I don't know how it works in Mexico, so you want, yeah. Yeah, so um, you started, we all started with like small tournaments around my area, you know, like those kind of, yeah, pretty much, I could say it was like country club tournaments, and then you go uh, by state. Um, you play like by state, you know, people from around your, your, your town or whatever. And then from that, you play uh, tournaments that are from your region. And then um, after your region, you have like a kind of national tournaments as well. 
and they are like divided by grade so pretty much anyone in the nation can join them and it goes from grade five until uh, grade one grade one is the the biggest one like national where the best players go and you have the grade five it's like more for beginners so I started playing those, you know, and as you start doing better, you know, semifinals, um, quarterfinals, final, you start moving up into the ranking, then you're able to play the bigger tournaments. And that's how I started uh, moving on. All right. So you, you said, obviously, your father was the biggest motivator and kept pushing you. Um, so obviously, we know you went to uh, play in Spain for your junior development. So tell us about how, first of all, how that came up came up in your dad's mind and why Spain and why that academy and uh, yeah how like I want to know how the process started from Mexico to Spain and when it happened okay um, so this is one of the things I, I think um, you know is I don't know how people want to call it destiny like a really big coincidence I don't know um, how to call it but it's just like that one thing that changed my life yeah. I could say and it started uh, probably when I was like 12, 13 years old, and I didn't know about that, but it's that, that's where it really came from. So we were going on this uh, family trip to Argentina, and um, one of my dad's friends, best friends, that he was playing tennis as well, he called him that morning, you know, like just checking up on him, like, how are you doing? I, I haven't heard from you in a while. And they chat, um, he told him that we were going to Argentina for holidays, and he's like, oh, I have a friend over there, like, he's a coach, you should uh, give him a call, and you know, just maybe you can get your, your kid to play some matches over there. And my dad was like, yeah, cool, I'll get the number. So we are on this trip in Argentina, and then, um, you know, my dad on a Saturday morning, uh, he, he pulls out the, the phone number, and he just gave the, call, the guy a call and he didn't, he didn't answer like first times and, and it was like that moment. Uh, he was about just, you know, throw the phone number away because he didn't uh, reply and, and it was also a family thing because uh, my, they used to, he used to fight a lot with my mom because uh, he was kind of obsessed with tennis and this was like kind of holiday trip. So there was like three, two choices, you know, enjoy the family trip or, or call the guy. Yeah. So he tried one more time to call the, the yeah. coach and he finally re uh, replied and yeah, I got to play, you know, some tournaments, but he made that contact with that guy. Yeah. So later on in the years when I was uh, doing better, you know, they, ke they kept in touch and I was probably 15 years old and, um, and during a chat with him, he told him that uh, he knew this guy, uh, Javier Ferrer. He had some contacts over there, and and there was one of my friends that wanted to go to an academy for summer. So my dad said, um, "Why well, they should go um, to that academy and you know you try it for two weeks, and I I, I make some more contacts, right?" Yeah. So he went with my friend. Um, they came back. They, they loved it, um, and you know I was just I was still in Mexico, school, uh, you know, practicing with other guys. Wait, so just to confirm, your dad was, because he was a coach, he went with your friend to Spain to, right. to look at that, uh, to try the academy. What's the academy's name? Uh, it's uh, David Ferrer's Academy. Oh, so it's called David Ferrer's Academy. Yeah, okay. Ferrer's Academy. Ferrer's Academy, okay. So, yeah, next thing I know, um, my dad said, that I, I, I would like to send you as well, you know, to try the academy and see if you like it. Um, on this point of my career, I, I was struggling a little bit because of, of the, that kid relationship as a coach is, is very tough. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I was having like that, um, that down and I didn't know really, I really didn't know what to do. I was uh, probably about to quit tennis. Uh, so yeah, he just uh, said that could be an option, you know. Uh, go try over there. Uh, we didn't have the we didn't have the mindset of me staying there. You know, it was more like a break thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you go play with some other kids, have get some fresh air, and yeah, I went for the summer. So, so w which summer is this? Two thousand fourteen. This is probably two thousand thirteen. Okay, I summer of two thousand thirteen. You go there just to try out. Like yeah. summer, try it out. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Try out and you know have uh, some guys. Um, yeah, first thing I noticed uh, when I arrived there, like, practices were really, really hard. Tough, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was just all-day practice, um, high-performance academy. 
a very uh, personalized focus on every player. Okay, yeah. So, um, you, so your your level just went from here. Like you, you didn't even you didn't even have an idea of tennis level that was at that high. So yeah. you just you're just like whoa, okay. A new whole new tennis world just was like presented to you. Exactly. So yeah. it was like kind of a shock, I'm guessing. Um, more of a shock of the tennis level. I think it was the shock for uh, um the work. The work ethic. The, the work the ethic that was on daily and you know, was such a good consistency. The grind. The grind, yeah. Okay. That's, that's when I was uh, first introduced to the grind. I could say. <laughs> okay, yeah, that and makes sense. So, I stayed there uh, probably, I was staying for a month, then um, my dad uh, got uh, contacted by some other place from Mexico to bring them to the academy, so I ended up staying two months. Okay. And um, by the end of the summer, when I was about to to go back home, you know, as my time over there was done, I just got, um, in the middle of practice, one of the head coaches uh, asked me to come to his office and and he uh, just asked me if, if I would like the idea to stay there, to live. Um, and I, of course, I, I was not expecting them to like to be serious. So I, I said, yes, I mean, of course, yeah, I love yeah, it here. Yeah. I would love to be here. And next thing I you know, he asked me uh, if I wanted uh, to get a scholarship to, to stay there and practice there. Uh, because they really like um, like pretty much my game and the work ethic I developed. They they thought I had like a really good potential, so they offered me that. And so I didn't really think about it. I just said yes. Oh, so you said yes. yes. What, did, did your father talk to that guy? I'm guessing your father told the guy to talk to you, or was it just like the guy just talked to you first time? Like uh, I'm not sure if they they talked before that. Um, okay. And and you were what 14, 15 at this time. Uh, 14 and a half, probably. 14 and a half in 2013, the summer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then what happens? You go back to Mexico? So, yeah, next thing that happens, I, I said yes. Yeah. So, you know, we start all the paperwork or whatever, like trying to figure out in what was needed for me to, to do it. And yeah, I flew back to Mexico. I started, uh, I had to drop out from my school, um, get like all my grades, um, you know, go to the Spanish embassy, start all the paperwork and to see if I was going to get approved. Mm -hmm. And that was probably in August and around third, second week of September, uh, I was packing my bags and flying to Spain. You were back going back to Spain. Uh, and sorry, sorry guys, we didn't tell you this, but this is in Alicante, Spain. Alicante, yeah, yeah, Alicante, right. yeah. Coast. Okay, so, so that's how you got introduced to the academy, and what happens next? What, give us some specifics. You spend the next, I'm guessing, three years at that academy training. Um, you come back in the summers, I'm guessing, to Mexico? Um, yeah, yeah, for the summer, it was mostly I will have to stay over there. Oh, you, you stay there? I will probably come back home for two, three weeks, but um, since summer, you know, it's that time when you don't have to go to school. They wanted me to be there, you know, to play some tournaments and practice and get the most of it. Okay, so um, how was the routine there? Tell us, like, let's say a typical day with school. How, give us, like, a, a, uh, a timeline of your day. Okay, um, so we will get uh, woke up, wake up, we had uh, this guy at the, first of all, we used to live in a tennis residency for student athletes. Was it uh, at the academy? It was within the, the, yeah, the campus. So the thing was, the academy had like school inside and academy inside and it had like the dorms inside. So we were pretty much like inside oh, wow, like okay. this big facility. So there was uh, this guy that would come at 6.50 a.m. He would knock on the door, you know, make sure we wake up. He would even come in and turn on the light, so you make sure we don't fall asleep. Um, so we had to, uh, you know, wake up, take a shower, brush our teeth, get ready uh, to go downstairs on the same building. We had breakfast for us prepared, so we should, we will come uh, have breakfast, then come come upstairs again, okay. um, get our room ready. You know, they had like this policy that you had to leave your room uh, so clean that it looks like nobody's living there. So oh, wow. They really have like this kind of policy. I, I just want to chime in that. I feel like that is like, you know, that really helps the mentality. I really it do. Does. And, it, and it, it goes into your life, you know, further down, you know, you, you, you almost have the mentality like, I need to make my room clean. Yeah, definitely. And, and, I, can, and I can count on that. Your room is very clean most of the time. <laughs> so I guess that works. So yeah, so 
you clean your room? So yeah, uh, we cleaned your room and then we started our uh, classes um, at 8 a.m. So we have to be at the classroom at 8 a.m. It was a regular school, you know, we were going to with a student, like regular students. Um, yeah, pretty much regular school. We'll, be, we'll have class 8 to 1040, if I'm not wrong. And then at 1040, we'll have like a little 10, 15 minutes break, probably like 10. Uh, we'll go to the cafeteria again, uh, grab some food, I don't know, banana, something like that, a fruit of uh, kind of pre-workout for our practice, mm -hmm. for morning practice. And then we'll have to be around 10.50 um, in the courts already warming up, you know, kind of mobility, you know, the, those exercises. Yeah, 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 okay. Uh, and 11, we had to be already warming up with the racket. So we'll practice 11 to about 12, 45, 50. Then we'll just uh, quickly go upstairs again to our room, in the same residency. So just, just to confirm, what, what's the practice like? You're hitting with someone? Or are you doing drills? What are you doing? So, so for, for, for the morning, it was mostly doing, doing drills and kind of conditioning. conditioning. Uh, we, we were doing a lot in the mornings, uh, work out with uh, these like bands, you know, they, they hold you like a... Uh, okay, resistance the, training, the waist, band, yeah, yeah, okay. medicine balls, it's, it's for like a uh, tough, tough practice was in the morning, morning, I would say. The, okay, the, okay. So yeah, they, they, they carve you in in the morning. Yeah, a lot of conditioning and drills. And yeah, after that we'll just go um, around 12.50, we'll, we'll just go upstairs, shower again, um, get dressed again with our uniform for school. Um, have a lunch, so we will eat, yeah, they, it will open like around 1, and at 1.15 we will have to be uh, backing into the classroom because the, the next class started, so we kind of had like 15 minutes to eat, something like that every day. Then we will go back to class 1.15 to 3 p.m. 1.15 to 3 p.m., okay. 3 PM, so yeah. One question, when you were training, the normal students were still studying at the school? Yeah. 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 So the missed classes, how did that work? So what happened, uh, they will uh, arrange for every class. For example, I used to have a roommate as well over there and we we're both like all the time together. They will arrange our class in a way that the classes that we will miss will not affect like our knowledge. For example, they will, uh, they will put us when we are practicing, they will put, um, how do you say, fitness life, uh, uh, fitness life, something okay. like that. So something the like students that. were like kind of working out as well. And then another, another class, like um, they had like this language, Valenciano. So, which pretty much didn't affect us because it's like the language they... they yeah, they yeah, that makes sense. These are like ele electives almost. You yeah, 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 kind, kind of, of elective, elective, elective classes. classes. So, so we're not missing class, class at all. Okay, yeah. So you go back uh, to classes from what time after lunch? So yeah, um, we had lunch about 1 p.m. to 1.15. And then 1.15 to 3 p.m., we will go um, to school again, you know, classes, regular classes. 3 p.m., again, like kind of running. We have like, I remember like running all the time, like to get the elevator, go to my room, get dressed again, you know, my tennis clothes, get my rackets and really go um, downstairs really quick. We'll practice tennis um, from 3 to 5, I would say. 3 to 5, what are you doing now on the court? So, Mostly on the evenings, we're, uh, we're, we're doing more like points and, you know, more live ball. Okay. More live ball, you know, some rallies, uh, change of direction, uh, kind of that stuff. Yeah, but pretty much points for the evenings. Okay, so more match play, uh, you can call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah more match play. And um, we'll have that, that practice from 3 to 5 p.m. Then at 5 p.m. we'll have a break, um, 5 to 5.30 which we will go again upstairs, grab some food. Um, they will prepare for us like this, uh, this baguette, a kind of healthy baguettes that we could have, uh, have after practice. You know, we have bananas, apples, like fruits. Oh, okay. um, and then 5.30, we'll jump again into um, fitness conditioning. So you have that meal of like, you're calling it like a basket of fruits? They, they, yeah, they will bring us. Basket of fruits, and then that's like you have a 30 minute break, and then you're back on court for fitness. Yeah, it's kind of a refueling uh, a okay. little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll not eat anything big, just like snack to keep yeah, us yeah. like good. So we'll go back to fitness at uh, 5.30 until uh, around 6.30, 6.45 usually. Um, we're doing, well, one thing we're doing a lot is like a lot of running. Like we'll, I remember working a lot on like sprints. 
Mm -hmm. um, we had like this exercise that I really hated, <laughs> which we had like were like three blocks of 12 minutes. So for the first block, you will have to sprint one minute and, okay. and kind of jog for one minute. One minute running the sprinting, one minute jogging. Then after you finish that block, you will rest like three, four minutes. Next one will be uh, same thing, but 30 seconds and 30 seconds. And the third one will be 15 seconds and 15 seconds, which was the toughest. So this was um, in the fitness sessions. And you're, where are you doing this stuff once a minute on? What? one minute off is this on the tennis court or is this on the track oh these are they were happening in the soccer field okay so on grass yeah on okay grass. so one minute on one minute off and then you go 30 seconds on 30 seconds um off and then you have 15 seconds so this is a 12 minute um each each set is 12 minutes yeah oh okay so 12 into 3 that's 36, 36 minutes of just running and you have so that's already almost an hour of fitness and what else would you do in a fitness like tell us something like that you would find really tough. Obviously, this is really tough as well, but I'm just saying, you know, these people listening, they would obviously like to know more of the fitness. Because, guys, tennis fitness is not easy. You have to put in the work, okay? This guy's been, this guy did it for three straight years, and a lot of people think tennis is just, you know, I'm going out there serving. That's not. So, like, professional players have to put a lot of work outside of the tennis court. So, I'm just trying to emphasize that. So yeah, I think um, yeah, the, the toughest uh, workouts that we had um, was these days that we have we kind of have both uh, um, running and weights. So we will do like um, not heavy weights, but you know we have like this. They will make like these circuits of legs, for example, that you will just not stop. You know, you will just like be um, switching around stations, and then after that they will make us you know uh, jump into the bike and like with a high resistance. And we kind of have like a, pretty much it was a day that you will hit like weight room and spinning. And at the end, you will have like kind of a, to relax, running like 25 minutes, 30 minutes. But just like, just relax. I, I love how you say relax. Yeah. And like after all that, that just actually does. It must feel relaxing, no? Like just 25 minutes of no one's pushing you, just run you know, yeah. to a normal pace. Yeah, but it, it, was, it was kind of tricky as well because uh, they made us wear a pulsometer. Uh, heartbeat monitor? Yeah, heartbeat okay. monitor. So they will require us, like even if we're running, you know, just like to, to relax the legs, yeah, yeah, yeah. they will require us to have like a minimum of heart rate and they will check it. Oh, wow. So, so in, the, in the case that you are going lower than that, you will probably run a little bit longer. So what, what was it? Like, was it uh, like 80% heart rate or was it percentage or was it specific? Did they tell you, right? Uh, it was around 165. Uh, Beats per minute. Beats per minute, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's around, I'd say, what is it, like 60, 70? Because yeah, it's yours just, is, max order is probably like 190. Yeah. Five-ish at that point. No, yeah. well, 200 actually at that point, because 220 is a max, yeah. So that's still, yeah, that's quite a lot. So 25 minutes of that, you're saying? And that was also on the uh, football field? Yeah, also football field. Okay, so, okay, so, and after that? What are we doing after the fitness or? So yeah, we'll have fitness. Then, you know, we'll have like the, this trainer from school that will help us stretch one by one. So we'll be stretching and then you will be rotating with him, you know, so he makes sure we, we stretch properly. Um, oh. So we will probably be done with everything uh, tennis wise around 7. 7 p.m. You guys are done with school and tennis. With tennis. With tennis, okay. With tennis. So we'll just uh, go upstairs again, take a shower, get dressed again, and go back to, to study. We have like a, these additional hours that were like for us to study. Um, if, I, if I'm right, I think it was 7 to 9 p.m. So okay. we'll, we'll go back to the classroom, you know, pretty much. Um, we'll have like professors review with us what they see in the day, you know, just have like some feedback again. And you have this time to do homework, uh, study. It was nine uh, to seven to nine p.m. I thought, and um, again we had like uh, a guy that was making sure we were going uh, every time over there, you know, help us. And then nine p.m. to ten, ten thirty, was like dinner time. So you know, just get renewed with the other athletes and have dinner over there, chill a little bit. And after that time, you can, you know, we have like these ping pong tables downstairs. You could just go play paddle. Um, there were a lot of things that you could do around by the night, 
I went to see what down, but I, I was actually not doing much. I was just like, uh, I mean, I could guess, bro. I, anyone would be just completely done by that. Like, yeah. like that routine, that, you know, I, I was wandering off and I was just imagining, you know, I'd be like, by 9 p.m., I just want to, I want a meal and I just want my bed to just, you know, knock out. Yeah, exactly. You know, but it must feel good, you know, coming after a hard day of studying and tennis and fitness, you know, it must feel just like absolutely amazing just to have a nice warm bed to sleep in, you know. So you did three years of that. Yeah. So if anyone wants to be looking into going into academy, we're not going to go into this too much because I feel like we can do another podcast about that going into academy. But what is one thing you'd say that, that like one thing, this is the best thing you benefited off that academy, uh, David Ferris Academy. The best thing you would say that really, like your game went from here to here because of that academy. Um, I, w- I would say it's uh, kind of two things because of that spe- specific academy. Um, one of them is the work ethic. Mm-hmm. I developed that like very strong. As I said, the routine, you know, that, that routine is, is tough. Yeah. So once uh, I go back and, and I think I was able to do that every day for, uh, for a period of time, a good period of time, um, when I arrived here, I, I was like, okay, my, my, I actually have like so much more time, you know, and, yeah. and I know what the, not having time at all is. Yeah. So everything becomes much easier. Um, that's one big thing I learned and I improved for my tennis uh, career in general. And second, I say is the, um, the ability to have like so many players around you that you can play with. You know, uh, it's not the same as you practice with someone all, every day, you know, you get used to the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When you have like so many players around, um, you just can just feel different balls every day, you know, you can improve. Okay, I can, with this guy, I can improve my, my return on the kick backhand. With this guy, I can improve my consistency. And those like are the things that uh, just add up together. Yeah, that, that, that 100% makes sense. The people you practicing with, hanging out with. I mean, to be honest, like, you know, you once told me Demonor was at your academy. Just imagine just like you're playing, you're hitting, and then on the next four, Demonor's hitting. I think your game is going to go up like just like 10, 15% just by that. Dude, this guy's hitting, so I got to, you know, up my game. Yeah, you definitely get a, get a pump. Yeah, you, get you know, pump. that and getting that every day, playing with better players, that really, you know, in the long term, it's really going to help you. So, moving on, how did Norfolk State come into your life and how did the process of getting from an academy in Spain to college tennis happen? Um, so, I always had the idea of coming to college to play. I think it was one of uh, my dad's and mine goal when I was a kid, because yeah, we knew this guy that was uh, playing here and I would hear from his experiences, you know, the life he was living, I thought was like, that was great, and I remember like daydreaming as a kid. You know, man, I I, I wish I would I would go there when I when I grow up. I don't know if I'll be able to, but it was like kind of a personal goal. Personal. So okay. I was always like pursuing that. So um, what actually happened? Um, I remember the day I talked to one of my coaches that I wanted to to pursue like a college tennis career, and there was a guy before me that he was already here. So I kind of knew a little bit um i could ask him you know those things say how did you get there the things you need uh, over there Mm -hmm. and to to some contacts i was able you know to get in touch with some some schools and and get uh, to the coaches i had like some face time with coaches and i started getting offers as um as i uh, moved to that graduation time so i kind of had like uh, different choices that i could pick uh, for me to, to go to different schools, uh, yeah. contacted you, but yeah. did you apply through an agent or were you doing this all by yourself? Um, it, it was through the agent that, uh, that uh, my friend priorly uh, used. Okay. All right. So, okay. So that is that guy back in Spain or where does he work from? Yeah, he's, he's in Spain. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, uh, what happened? Yeah. I just had some talks with different coaches and, uh, and I just clicked with one. We had like this uh, good relationship. I felt like he had like a strong, uh, strong uh, work ethic. And he was, uh, he matched like my interest. Um, I felt like it was a good trip and pretty much signed for him. And I started like all these uh, college process, you know, 
I had to send your grades, you have to get enrolled to the SAT, um, TOEFL, make sure you have a good English level, um, also that your high school grades are good, you have um, pretty much everything set up for you to get yeah. into the system. Sure. That process is definitely tough, it's so, yes. um, it's so confusing sometimes. So your agent helped you uh, look into colleges, you had a lot of coaches approaching you, you FaceTimed a few coaches. So uh, I'm guessing you um, contact you were FaceTime the Norfolk State coach at that time as well. So how did that happen? You Norfolk State, you cho you chose Norfolk State, you signed with them back in Spain, and then from there you got all your documents. And then like, what? When did you arrive? And then how how does that like? I, I want to know how does the academy getting off from the academy work? Like signing off from there. Um. So when I when I signed off, uh, it was pretty much. Uh, it was kind of a tough decision because they were, they were expecting me to, to turn pro after I was done uh, with my high school. Oh wow, really? So yeah, I think it was a little bit disappointing for him that I uh, chose to come to college. For, for who? For, uh, they, for, for, the, for the head coaches, yeah, for uh, Ferrer's brother, Javier Ferrer, and uh, for Javier. the other coach, uh, head coach, his name is Israel Dior. So, so, did, uh, so, so did Javier and the head coach, did they like talk to you? So did they say like, Hey, I think we, we, you should turn pro and like try out in the future. Or did they say, you know, it's your choice, but we would like you to be turning pro? Yeah, no, it, it was not like a straight talk, but um, since before I was graduating, they were already talking to me like about the plan for the next year, um, start playing more futures, you know, they were like already developing this kind of plan for me to start like my uh, mm -hmm. professional career. And um, the moment I told them like I, I would like to pursue a college tennis career, I just felt like a little bit of. Um, disappointment from them yeah yeah because they, you know they were already like saying like a long vision for me to start playing pro and um, I think they, they trusted me uh, for yeah. a long term but yeah it was uh, it was kind of hard to leave the academy as well for me because I, I felt like I was part of family over yeah. there yeah. it was not easy and they helped me so much uh, to develop my game and as I said it was something that uh, it changed my life yeah yeah it definitely changed my life so, um, yeah, I left the academy probably by the end of that summer and I came to Mexico. I had to work on my visa, on student visa, and, you know, uh, get as well on, on contact with the coach, to know where am I going to live, um, which day should I arrive, like how to enroll to my classes, anyone that I could talk to in case I have any questions. And they were really great at uh, providing all that information I had at my uh, personal, I'm not personal, we had like this advisor, athletic advisor, you know, which is um, you know, or a person that helps you in any question that you have, like academics or athletics wise, which is really, really helpful to, uh, when you arrive as a freshman. Yeah, they're very, athletic advisors, if you're a college athlete, they, I mean, hopefully they're a nice person, but for us, I mean, we they're yeah, they're really helpful. Hundred percent. They 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 understand how an athlete thinks. I think a lot of times because we we have to look out for so much more than a normal student, and they're helpful. Yeah. So so you're saying you're in Mexico and you're contacting people in Norfolk State, and then you when you come to uh, the United States for the first time. So um, I probably came like literally the weekend before the classes started. Okay. Um. By then we had like this problem because uh, the coach that recruited me, he, um, he kind of had a, a problem, I don't know, he resigned and then we had like this new coach coming like in, short, in such a short period of time, uh, like it's kind of two coaches, so, coaches, so I didn't know where I was uh, on like who should I contact, okay, um, who's going to see for my uh, housing now, like I had no idea. Yeah. So I literally just came, you know, like okay, I'll get there and then I guess I'll just figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Because I have to meet up my fathers. And I contacted some of my teammates, they were like really helpful. I, I still, I'm very really grateful for them. And I stayed with some of them for a couple days until I got um, housing with some other uh, teammates. And then I finally just got to move uh, to my own place. So that, that, that's, I think that pretty much sums up your tennis journey as of now, at least. So you're almost done with the college tennis. But so you ended up, uh, I just want you to talk about just a bit about how, why did you choose electronics engineering to major in and who influenced that just really quick. And then I also want to 
talk a bit more about managing that. So we'll get into that, but why, why electronics engineering? Because, I mean, it's hard, you know? You could have chosen business, you could have chosen... I mean, I'm not saying business is easy, but it's, you know, a little bit of less workload, definitely. Yeah. So, um, I really, uh, if I have to be honest, I was not sure what, what I was going to study when I first came here. Uh, I, I think we all have the doubt, okay, what am I going to do with my life? I really don't know. I'm not sure what I like, you know, and I'm about to get to college, so I, I have to pick something. So I think it started, uh, I have a cousin that he studied as well in the United States and he started engineering and then my dad, uh, he, he arranged like a talk with him and, um, you know, just talked to me a little bit, how is it, um, and that kind of stuff, the, the work that he's able to do and, uh, you know, the life that he has now because of studying engineering. So I felt like it was... I'm not going to say I was in love right away, but I, I felt it like interesting. I'm like, okay, maybe I want to take like a look on that. Yeah. And you know, my dad, my dad as well. So like, um, if you want to, if you're already going to college, you know, just take advantage of it and, and study either something that you're very passionate about and you can get the most of it. Yeah. Or, you know, um, if you don't know yet, just experience, yeah, engineering, like, you know, get a taste. And if you like it, just go all in, and if you don't, you can change your major. But, but he said that because um, engineering is like a good job. You know, you learn a lot of stuff. Yeah. And and he thought that it would be like a very good feel for me. On, um, for the future, future. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. But um, before coming to before deciding to university, did you look at the uh, undergraduate programs that your university provided or did you not yeah yeah, yeah did. and what did you think of that like because like for me when i was looking at that i was i i was looking primarily for an engineering program primarily mechanical but you know for an engineering program so did you did you say all right i need an engineering program at the school i go to yeah 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 we had like these options uh, when you when you are like looking for schools mm -hmm. uh, you want to match the school that not only is you are the best fit on but they are the best fit for you as well yeah, yeah. Perfect. According to what you're looking for, and yeah, Norfolk State was one of them. They had like really good program programs of engineering. Um, we even have like this uh, NASA program coming here. They did a lot of collaborations. Uh, Micron, Netflix, you know. Netflix. Uh, a lot of big companies coming here, and the program is strong. And I felt like the opportunity will be good, and there will be a lot for me to learn yeah. as well from here. So. Um... Obviously, you're a senior now. You've, you're doing a minor in computer science as well, which obviously um, is not easy as well. So how or when, when stuff gets hard, when you have an exam, when you have matches, when you have a lot of deadlines, how do you manage studies and tennis together? How, well, what is like what is some things that you do personally? Um, the things I do personally, I think I like a lot. Um, the day before, I always visualize my day, mm -hmm. my next day. Um, I am really organized, so I kind of structure it. Okay, as soon as I wake up, um, I like to have this thing that I, I have something to do. So as soon as I open my eyes the next day, I, I remember I have something to do, and that gets me out of the bed mm -hmm. to get stuff done. Um, as well as I have like this, uh, this application on my phone that helps me, you know, to just make my schedule for the day. And, you know, I have, okay, I have practiced this to this time. Then... Um, after that, you know, I have classes. First, I have like the things I, I must do, you know, I have no option. Mm -hmm. Class, practice, and gym. Those are like things I have to do daily. Have to do. Okay. And then I, um, after that, I just structure, you know, th those little spots, your times that I can use for you know, studying, you know, reading, uh, doing homework, um, pretty much eating as well, because that's important. Cooking, <laughs> cooking, cooking takes, takes a lot. Uh, yeah, 100%. I can agree on that. <laughs> So, um, guys, I can't believe it's been 40 minutes, by the way. It's crazy. This podcasting is no joke. Just to end it off, Andres, Mr. Andres Alcaraz, what are your future goals with life? What do you want to What do you want to do with tennis? Or if not, what do you want to do with, like, engineering? What, what are you, you going to be? Where, where do you see yourself in 10 years? What do you, what do you have for future? Well, as of now, I think um, I have... Um change my goals through college you know you have like all these experiences that shape your mind when mm -hmm. you go to college you start having different thinking and that that helped me a lot as of now i would like to probably after college 
just play tennis for fun. I don't think I will do professionally. Just um, hanging up the racket, professionally at least. Yeah, prof I'll still go, you know, have like this uh, fun. It's always fun to play with friends. I love competition, so I'll probably just play some few tournaments. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, um, I would like to pursue a career in um, software engineering and data science. Mm -hmm. um, you know, start getting into the field and and eventually like um, have a startup and uh, my own company. And you know, I'm I'm a little, I'm a guy that likes to diversify himself. So I'm, yeah, I would like to get <laughs> I would like to get like in different areas. You know, real estate, uh, investing, my own company, like those kind of stuff. So, that really opened up to me when I came to college. You know, I started seeing like a bigger picture of life. Oh yeah, and I think that that helped me a lot through my journey. All right, man. It's uh, been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. The first episode, we still don't know the name yet, but um, it's been crazy. It's been like 41 minutes. It's just crazy, amazing. Honestly, it was really enjoyable listening to your stories. It was like I was I was in Alicante right now. <laughs> I was in Mexico, Alicante, in the back here. So um, I I am glad you were on the sh on the podcast. Thank you for being here. Um, I hope we're, hopefully we're going to be back. We're going to be still doing podcasts. And yeah, guys, thank. Oh, it's not recording. Um, thank you for listening in, guys. I hope you learned something, maybe a thing or two from uh, Andres. Um, if you want to contact him, if you want to reach out to him, ask him any questions, I'll link uh, his Instagram down below. And this is it for the first uh, episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Share it with your friends who might benefit off it or, you know, anyone that is looking for college tennis or just tennis uh, overall. And, yeah, guys, thank you for listening, and I'll catch you later.